So as I started to um, prepare for this today, and, and uh, I started thinking of how I spent probably the last two and a half years traveling all over the country. I probably talked to hundreds, if not thousands, of people about SDN, shared how we thought this was going to affect our network, talked to them about how they, uh, how they saw this going. And when I was invited to come talk about SDN and the enterprise, what it, we're doing with it today, where we see this going, I came back to this typical response I get, usually from people who run you know, operations for a large enterprise network. When I start talking to them about what we're doing today, how we're investing in SDN, how we're deploying it today, uh, I'll talk about uh, one of the production deployments we have, how we're building our own software on top of controllers, I get this very sort of typical response, which is along these lines. Well, that's all great. You're at a university. You have a mission to do research. You can go do your research. You do this cutting edge thing. But that really doesn't apply to me. That doesn't apply to my enterprise network. I have real problems I need to solve. Um, that's great. You go play in, 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 your, in your sandbox there. Um, but that's not the approach I come from at all. right? I've been the network architect for the university uh, for about 10 years. And when I first started looking at OpenFlow, the thing I saw was how we're going to use this to solve real problems. Um, so when I think people make that comment, they're, they're really missing two things. One, this is not just about research. This is about solving real problems on our enterprise network, which I'll describe in a bit. And we have the same security problems, the same compliance, the same reliability that any other network has. Actually, I think that large research universities have one of the most complicated, difficult to manage networks of anywhere. Why is that? Well, first, we have a lot of users. 120,000 or more of them. The vast majority of them bring their own device, and they've been doing that for 15 or 20 years. Unlike most enterprises, the vast majority of our users pay us, not the other way around. They get to bring anything they want and put it on our network. Thousands of gaming systems, any consumer electronics you could imagine, all that has to come onto the network. I'll talk about that a little bit more. It's a large network. Thousands of switches, over 5,000 wireless access points, 100,000 switch ports. You know, that is complicated to manage. Networking a large campus is a lot like trying to network an entire city. Right? We don't just have classrooms, research labs, and lecture halls. We have hospitals. We have doctor's offices. We have medical labs. Dozens of restaurants, theaters big sports complexes. We are our own residential broadband provider, over 15,000 students living in apartments and residence halls that we run. Police departments. We are our own water and electric utility. We have smart uh, meters, hundreds of them, all over our campus. Right? All these different things need to be supported. We are responsible for the network, down to the user, for all of those environments. So we have compliance requirements. We have HIPAA, we have PCI DSS, we have FERPA, and probably a whole long list of things I'm glad I don't know about. And we do have a mission to support research. And what that means is if we have a faculty come to us that has a robot they developed that they want to control over a wireless network for their research project, we can't just say, no, take that home. You can't use that. We have to support it, and we have to figure that out. And we can't compromise the security of all those other systems that I mentioned while doing it. When you have an enterprise this large and this diverse, there is no way you can centralize all the IT operations. Historically, universities, in, in universities, it's been very federated. Each department not only operates their own infrastructure, they build their own infrastructure, they're buying their own switches, they're buying their own servers, they're maintaining their own machine rooms. Economically, that doesn't work out. What they, all the universities want to do now, you want to move to shared infrastructure. And, and it starts looking a lot like these large multi-tenant data centers. I want one fast, reliable, cost-effective infrastructure that then I can virtualize and push the management of each of those virtual pieces of that out to the departments where they know their applications and they know their security requirements. I can't possibly understand their security, all the security requirements of a police department and a radiology department and all those other things. We need to push the control of that out, but we need to get the efficiencies of one infrastructure. So I want to talk about what we're doing with SDN today and the near-term solutions we see. So I mentioned all our BYOD uh, users, and, and, and we were 
supporting that you know, a decade before there were commercial NAC solutions. So we have our own NAC solution. It's fairly sophisticated. But when you look at the enforcement points of, of, of where you can make enforcement on the network, you only have a couple pieces if you really want to do this at scale. Right? We have DHCP. We can unregister MAC addresses. We can move them into a CAFTA portal with, with DNS and DHCP. Um, we have BGP route hole injection. And we have a whole set of APIs where when we detect something in our intrusion detection system, we can automatically move that user back into a captive portal, block their traffic, and automatically walk them through a process of getting back onto the network. So how does OpenFlow fit? How does SDN fit into that? Well, obviously, we, when we're looking at how we uh, in, enforce policies on the network, how we block users, move them in and out of captive portals, we see SDN as a much more elegant way of doing it. It's way more granular. It's way more flexible than the course mechanisms of BGP route hole injection or simply deregistering a MAC address. So that's one piece. We haven't started building that yet, but we've done a lot of discussion around what that would look like. The piece we have built is up at the upper left of, of the diagram here, which is our intrusion detection cluster. So to, to be able to have enough actionable information to take action to, to enforce on the network, you need a, you need a large intrusion detection cluster. Uh, so as we wanted, went to scale that out, we wanted to be able to have uh, you know, up to 32 10 gigabit intrusion detection systems clustered uh, to handle all the load, and we needed a load balancer to do that. Um, we like using Snort and Bro because it's open and we can integrate it with the rest of the system and all the APIs that we've built. Um, so we wanted to maintain that, um, and, and so we needed to build out this cluster. And so we built a load balancer on top of an OpenFlow controller um, that controls the top of rack, the 10 gig top of rack switch we already have that those servers already connect to. Uh, we feed all the span traffic into that, uh, that 48 port 10 gig switch and we span it across all of the switches. So that's available today. It's called FlowScale. It's on openflowhub.org. If you're interested, go download it. You can go use it uh, with an OpenFlow switch. Um, so that's an, an example of a kind of point solution where we had a problem today um, and, and within a short period of time we were able to write our own software to solve a problem. Incidentally, we saved uh, something in the neighborhood of about $150,000 by going that route. So the other thing we started thinking about really early on is, is actually a problem that I believe Martin Casado talked a little bit about in his, his talk last fall uh, at, at the summit, which is we have these great mechanisms for distributing layer two and layer three state in our networks. We have protocols, they're, they're scalable, they're reliable, they're interoperable between vendors. But when you look at security policy state, it's all over the board, right? ACLs, typically a human at a terminal or an expect script, or an expect script uh, emulating a human at a terminal to push that policy out into the network. Putting devices into a VLAN or a virtual network uh, it, it's either radius to push policy down to a switch or SNMP writes to change the VLAN of a port. When you look at most of your security policy, it exists in your firewalls. How's the state pushed into your firewalls? It's typically a proprietary console for the vendor of that firewall, or it's an expect script that you've hacked together yourself to emulate a human typing at the console of that box. It's all over the place. This is not scalable. When you have a network the size of ours, when you have dozens of security devices, hundreds of ACLs all over the place, there's no way you can manage that state in this way. So it's obvious that something like STN is a great mechanism for pushing that state out. But there's actually another problem here, which is the way we're managing that state today. If you think about it, you're putting security state into physical places in your network. You're dropping a firewall appliance. You're dropping an intrusion detection appliance. Our networks are not easily grouped by physical space. Right? Take a look at our biology building. You say, OK, I want to put a firewall in front of the, bi the, the biology building. Well, what about that coffee shop on the first floor with a point of sale device on the network? What about the smart meter? Right? I don't want to put those on the same network as the student in, in the lab. That doesn't make any sense. And what you end up seeing is I have you know, 10, 15, 20 security zones in every building. What you really want to do is group those logically. You want to group all those smart meters. You want to group all those systems that are alike across physical space and then apply your security policy on the traffic going between those logical segments. That's the only possible way to manage the complexity of security policy on a scale uh, th that we're dealing with. So that's where you end up with, can I go back? 
that's where you end up with the, the diagram over the right, this idea of we're going to have these virtual networks that span physical space and we're going to control a security policy. That starts looking a lot, again, like the problem set you have in a large multi-tenant data center. The difference is we have not just hypervisor switches, but we have physical switches and we have wireless access points. Um, we have physical devices that we cannot control the movement of. They randomly move around the network and we have no control over that. We don't even know when it happens until it happens. So there are differences, but the problem set is largely the same. So if you drill down a level and say, okay, great, that's at a 10,000 foot level how I want to manage my network, what does that start looking like? How does that influence the architecture of an enterprise network? We're looking two, three, five years out on where we're going. What's that network going to look like? How that, is that network going to be different than the kind of networks we're building today? First, you need a virtualized access layer. Uh, you heard a number of different people talking about this. You, you, the access layer needs to be virtualized. You need to be able to dynamically map ports, devices, into a virtual context within that access layer. Separation of that traffic. Secondly, you need to push all that complexity to the access layer and you need to control that complexity through SDN. The only way you're going to control the complexity when you have thousands and thousands of these access devices is to do it through central coordination. We've learned this with wireless, right? We could not manage 5,000 access points with two wireless engineers if we didn't have controller-based wireless. We need that same paradigm for the entire network, for the hypervisor access layer, for the wiring closet access layer, and for the wireless access layer. Again, as we did with wireless, you push that all down to the edge and then you build overlays, right? That's exactly how we do this. Layer three mobility in a wireless context is really no different than, v than, than virtual, moving virtual machines around the data center, right? You put them into a virtual context and a virtual machine in a data center and then you want to move that to a different physical space. That's no different than putting up an SSID on a wireless access point and, and having a, a laptop roam from one building to another building. Exact same problem set. And I think the solution is the same. It's L2 and L3 overlays. Um, which means you have a, a, you know, a simple layer three fabric in the core that you can easily scale up cost effectively. Next, the network needs to become a platform. You cannot build a networking product that is all things to all customers. The way we want to manage our network, the way we need to manage our network is very different than the way other enterprises need to manage the network. Yes, we want the functionality. We would like it all, in the, uh, all there, but at all different layers of the network, we need to be able to plug in and customize that, whether that is loading code into firmware, whether that's building an application on top of the SDN controller, whether that's access into the database that drives the network management system so we can build custom web interfaces for different departments for different groups. All different layers need to be programmable and customizable. I touched on this a little bit, but the, the different access layers need to be unified. The way I manage and control my hypervisor access layer versus my wiring closet access layer versus my wireless access layer today are completely different. The control's different, the management's different. Those all need to be unified. One common access layer. And then we need to be able to flexibly and scalably insert L4 through 7 services on top of each of those virtual networks. So this is what I think the, the, the architecture of the, of the enterprise looks like in the future. The future could be hopefully uh, uh, you know, two, two years, maybe less down the road. This is where we want to go. At the bottom you have this unified access layer that's virtualizable. Whether it's a hypervisor switch, an access point, or a physical switch, uh, you, you want that to be virtualizable. You want to be able to assign ports, you want to be able to assign devices into, dynamically into those different buckets. Above that you have this simple layer three fabric. Fast, reliable, easy to manage. On the top, and I wasn't, as I was drawing this actually last night, I wasn't quite sure how to, to, to represent this, but the, the qualities you want from that L4 through 7 service insertion layer is you, you want it to be easily scalable. You want it to be dynamically be able to create different services, whether it is, it's load balancing or firewall or intrusion detection for these different virtual networks. And then you want to be able to easily scale that up as bandwidth, requires, uh, bandwidth requirements dictate. I don't want to have to keep buying big iron at large steps to, to, to increase that up. It needs to be much more uh, scalable and flexible. 
Over to the left, you have your software-defined networking controller. The two pieces I think you most want to manage are those virtualizable pieces, the L4 through 7 layer and the virtualized access layer. That is really where you want to push the complexity into the network all the way out to the edges. Now, if you have a very large fabric, in our case, we're likely to have hundreds of routers in that fabric, you probably want some of those same nice centralized management features that you're going to want for the edge there. But I'm, I don't think you want to push, uh, I don't think you need to push uh, SDN to the control plane of that, of, that, of that fabric in the middle. So there's some more information, um, and I thank you for your time. of Intel. Uh, just a real question, Matt. How, how far along are you in um, implementing your plans? Um, so, so we have a couple uh, small pilot deployments. So, so the, the load balancer is done. That's in production. Our current intrusion detection system is, is, is based on that. It's all running today. When you start talking about the longer term picture, the things I talked about at the end, you know, we're in the early stages of that. We have about a, a two year time frame uh, until we do a, a forklift upgrade uh, on that access layer. Um, and that's really the, the time frame we're targeting and we're doing a lot of, uh, you know, build up to that. That's not something you do overnight. So uh, a lot of pilots and experimentation. How far are you taking mobile as a baseline for your next generation network? And would that network in the architecture look like what you presented? Um, so I, I think the, the answer is largely yes. If you look at the growth in our network, um, we, we put some, some projections together six, seven years ago about where wireless devices, how that growth was going. The vast majority of our, our devices on our enterprise network are wireless. Um, and so that's when you start looking at what we're doing with controller-based wireless today. When we started looking at that four or five years ago, it, it very much maps into what we want to do with the rest of the network. But the wired devices are growing just as well, but it's not traditional devices. Right? It's, it's the HVAC systems, it's the electric meters, it's the Coke machines, it's the laundry machines. I mean, those are the things that's really driving the growth on the physical layer of the network. Um, but wireless is, is a huge piece of it, and mobile's a huge piece of it. Um, and, and yes, that's driving the, our architectural And direction. you make no difference between a mobile and a wireless. Oh, uh, so you, you're talking about cellular wireless. Um, so. Um, yeah, we see that as a big piece too. So we, unlike a lot of enterprises, we've never had this sort of you know uh, uh, crunchy outside, soft middle, um, where you don't allow people to come in from the outside on the wireless end. We've never built our network that way. Uh, it's completely impossible to do. So a lot of the barriers you see from other enterprises of how do I handle a user that's out on someone else's network doesn't really affect us. Great. I think just one last one, um, and then we'll um, transition. Sure. So the gentleman to the far left. Thank you. Um, just on the point of the IDS appliance, and I was wondering why that was picked for the first uh, load balancing application for an open flow environment uh, versus other. Was there anything specific in terms of the, the long-lived flows versus short-lived flows, or was it more an appliance function that you had to kind of scale out, and that's why you picked it? So the question is why we picked the load balancing as sort of the first application? For an IDS type of in environment versus uh, some load other, other functions. Um, one, it was a problem that we had. <laughs> um, you know, w w our security office came to me about a year ago and said, you know, we want to go spend a quarter million dollars you didn't budget for uh, to go build something. Um, and, and we only really need this one little thing. And it was, well, we can obviously do this with OpenFlow today. Um, and it was something we were really excited to get started with actually deploying it in, in production. So it was a really uh, obvious candidate to, to, to pick off. Okay, great. Thank you, Matt.